My name is Patrick Keelty. I don't live here anymore, but I was born and raised in Northern Ireland. When I was 16, my father was shot dead by paramilitary gunmen. He was one of thousands of innocent people killed during the Troubles, the 30-year civil conflict that turned this place into a war zone. I became a comedian, telling jokes about the politics and the violence. I've actually got something here. It's especially for the English people, and it's the Northern Ireland <laughs> national costume. <laughs> hey. But in 1998, 10 years after my dad was killed, a deal known as the Good Friday Agreement brought an end to the bloodshed. Today, we have the chance to live in peace, the chance to raise children out of the shadow of fear. Hundreds of paramilitary prisoners were released, including my father's killers. In return, we were promised a new society where the two sides could come together. Now I've come home to find out how far down that road we've traveled. Richard. Yes, Paddy, how are you doing? I'll be meeting people like me, whose lives were changed forever by the conflict. I have to say this is the first time that I've been back at this particular site since I was shot, so. Are you kidding me? And confronting those responsible for the violence. Do you regret what you did? I can't say that I regret what I did, Paddy, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I, I want you to be honest. I'll explore why Brexit has put the peace deal back in the spotlight. This is the border. There's no frontier post, it's just I'm in Northern Ireland. I'm in Southern Ireland. And 20 years after we voted for it, I want to uncover the real legacy of the Good Friday Agreement. We are currently driving through the middle of the Moor Mountains in County Down, and this is home. Dundrum, where I was born, is just a few miles on the north side of the mountain. Whenever I come here, you find yourself driving along, talking to yourself like Billy Connolly. And when you look at the light and the way it comes in, and it's just the most gorgeous, you can keep your Malibu. This is it. I look at that, I mean, I mean, you know, when we were growing up, we didn't realise how beautiful this place was. And what was going on in Belfast meant that this was quiet. There was no visitors, there was no tourists, nobody came. I'm from a small seaside village called Dundrum. It's in the southeast corner of Northern Ireland, which was created during the partition of Ireland almost a hundred years ago. Since then, it's been split between a Protestant majority, largely loyal to Britain, and a Catholic minority, mostly keen to reunite with the Republic of Ireland. By the time I was born into a Catholic family in 1971, that split had become a horrific civil conflict. As the Irish Republican Army fought it out with the British Army, and loyalist paramilitary groups. During the 30 years of the Troubles, more than 40,000 people were injured and over 3,500 lost their lives. But growing up, me and my brothers only really saw it on the telly. Our village, Dundrum, was largely untouched. They blew up the pub once, but otherwise, it was an amazing place to grow up. Oh, nice ball. And to be honest, we had more important business to take care of. Lovely. You can play that one, This is the Gaelic football pitch in Dundrum. Our house was just across the road. Myself, my brothers, my friends would be all over here kicking into these goals. And my dad was the chairman of the football club. Yes, well seen, Thomas. Oh, he's got a bit of silky skills there, doesn't he? I didn't know as a child that Gaelic football was exclusively played by Catholics. There were two schools in Dundrum. There was the Protestant school and there was the Catholic school. You thought that was normal. Looking back on that now, that is completely abnormal. 
but we knew nothing different. We weren't a political family, and it was a very, very idyllic childhood. Yeah, they're good, good team. Yeah. That all changed on the 25th of January, 1988, a week before my 17th birthday, when a car full of paramilitaries pulled up outside my dad's office. Two hooded men armed with handguns walked into the contractors at about a half past 11. They shot Mr. Kilty several times. I was in school and I was asked to go to the headmaster's office and they said, um, your dad's been shot. And I remember saying just immediately, is he dead? And I said, yes. My dad's office would have been just where the, the curb was. Very, very likable. Chairman of the local Gaelic football club. Would have done anything for you. Uh, his two sons had played on the county minor team that won the All-Ireland this year, Patrick and John. And very, very sadly missed. Everything about it felt you were going through it, but it wasn't real. There's a report about the man who's been killed. They're mentioning my dad's name. It became clear that the businessman may have been murdered by loyalists. The police have asked anyone with information about Mr. Keelty's murder to contact them. Nothing prepares you for the numbness that you actually feel when you go through it. There was someone from the village that was involved, someone who knew him and who met him and had decided he was next. I, I find that strange even after all this time. My dad wasn't involved in politics, but he was a well-known Catholic and an easy target. And although they never caught all those involved, three local loyalists were given life sentences for organising his murder. For years, the killing continued on both sides. Then in 1998, a decade after my dad died, we were all offered the chance to stop the violence. Every household in Northern Ireland, including mine, was sent a copy of the Good Friday Agreement. It set out a plan to disarm the men of violence, release paramilitary prisoners, and for both sides to share power in government. And then we voted on it. The people of Northern Ireland have given their overwhelming backing to the Good Friday Agreement. Yes, 71.12%. Yeah! So this is Carlingford Lock. This is about half an hour from my house. The Moor Mountains are just over there. And it's one of the few places you can actually see Northern Ireland on this side of the lock. And then the Republic of Ireland on that side of the lock. And the notion that an agreement could actually bring peace here was the moonshot. And that's why we all signed up for it. That's why everybody, and especially families like mine, put their faith in that agreement. Where is it now? We'll see. My first stop is Belfast, which has been totally transformed by 20 years of peace. Today, it's one of the fastest growing cities in the UK and has a real buzz about it. Busy, vibrant, and definitely on the up. It, it, it's really interesting. There's a brand new Belfast and it feels really exciting and it feels like this is a good place to be. But take a drive out of the city centre and there are still some reminders of the bad old days. In 1998, the peace deal said all paramilitary groups should put down their guns. While most did disarm, some are still active. Welcome to Mount Vernon in North Belfast, a stronghold of the Loyalist Ulster Volunteer Force. The UVF were involved in over 400 sectarian murders during the Troubles, including my dad's. I'm here to meet former UVF commander, Billy Hutchinson. 
Billy was convicted of the murder of two Catholics in 1974. He renounced violence in prison, and these days he's a local politician, but his party still has links to the UVF. Billy. Hello, Harry, how are you? Keep well. On, you well. I've met Billy before at my stand-up shows, and I'm hoping he can tell me why the UVF are still active here 20 years after the peace agreement. So whenever you signed up to join the UVF, what age were you? I was probably 16. So you joined the UVF at the same age I was when my dad was killed, and yet I never thought about joining the IRA. Well, I grew up in the Shagel Road, which would have been seen as very pro-British. I can recall the thing that actually affected me was the bomb going off in the Shagel. And when I turned up at the place, they were lifting bit of bodies and putting them into clear plastic bags. And there was an 18-month-old baby on a prom that was blown to bits. And I knew the parents. Mm. I felt what the IRA needed was a dose of their own medicine. My dad was an IRA. The two Catholics that you killed weren't IRA. How do you go from seeing innocent people killed to actually doing that yourself? The whole thing about it is, whether you were Republican or Loyalist, you would have argued there was a cause. You can't justify that to anybody else. That can't be justified to the outside world, but you can't justify it to yourself. Billy served 16 years in prison. While inside, he signed up to the peace process and went on to help negotiate the Good Friday Agreement. So I'm a bit confused about the artwork outside his office. One of the things in the agreement was that we need to draw a line under the past. Yeah. Why is it 20 years after the Good Friday Agreement, the UVF are still here? And there's a mural on the side of the wall saying, prepared for peace and ready for war. Well, I mean, there's a whole lot of reasons why those things are still there. Whenever you don't have a stake in society, the flag becomes the most important thing in your life. You've got 89% of the people that live in this state are unemployed. You know, it's a brilliant state. People mm. want to move on. People want to get jobs and do all that. Just do normal things. But but, but it's not it's normal. Just... It's not normal, Billy, because that mural isn't George Best. It's a man with a gun. No, no, I agree with you. Saying yeah. we're ready to go. Can you see how that would unsettle someone like me? Of course, Paddy. If it was my choice, what I would do is take the wall away. But not everybody would agree with it. What are the circumstances that they're ready for war? I don't think there are any. I think that we have moved on. Mm. I think paramilitaries know that the war is over. Mm. Uh, and I think that that's where paramilitaries are at. I like Billy. But 20 years after the agreement, I find it really, really strange to have a conversation with someone in a building that still has this on the side of the wall. And I didn't say this to Billy, but the artwork isn't particularly good. I mean, they look slightly more prepared for the cold than ready for anything. Still, the Good Friday Agreement has helped to drastically reduce the level of violence in Northern Irish society. At the time of my dad's death, there were thousands of armed paramilitaries, and it would have been easy for me to pick up a gun myself. The Sacred Heart Church in the County Down village of Dundrum was packed for the funeral of local building contractor Jack Keelty. My dad's brother had been approached in the graveyard by the IRA to say, look, you know, we could probably use a couple of good, smart, strong, strapping lads like those Keelty lads if they're interested in revenge. They were told in no uncertain terms where to go. But you can see how people's pain is channeled into causing somebody else's pain. Everybody wants to believe that they're the people that they love died for something. My dad died for nothing. He wasn't a political figure. He wasn't taking a stand. He had a building firm. He employed both sides. That wouldn't be considered a stand anywhere else. I mean, he was, he was just doing the right thing. This guy here, you could be a policeman, couldn't you? Yeah, with the sort of, the, yeah, <laughs> with the hair there. And uh, you could be a, a Royal Irish Regiment soldier, for all we know. And uh, this guy over here with the long hair, you just look as if you're out of long cash, don't you, sir? So, uh, yes, we all know what you could be. Uh, he's given me that look, I am. <laughs> uh, 
A year and a half after my dad was killed, I moved to Belfast to study psychology. But don't read too much into that. My real passion was stand-up comedy. This is The Empire, where 25 years ago I first got on stage and tried to find the funny in what we were living through. Having difficulty with a mortgage? <laughs> Not sure where to turn to? That's where we at IRA come in. Because when it comes to real estate, nobody shifts property quite like we do. Because my dad was killed, I felt I had a license to speak on behalf of everybody. It meant that no one could say to you, that's too far. Again, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to choose the night at the Empire. Give it up. The comedy night I used to host in the early 90s is still going strong. How's it going, David? Where are you from? England. England. Um, just stand up, just turn to everybody in the room and just go, we're really sorry. OK, yeah, good, yeah. And I've come back to see what impact 20 years of peace has had on the young comedians of today. Double act Shaw and Laurie are about to make their debut at the Empire. Oh. I mean, they are ba they are baying for blood. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I were, Set us at ease. You know, I, I've played this bit before. If I were you, I'd I'd escape now. Okay, so I want to talk about material. What type of stuff do you do? Do you stay away from the politics? Yeah, uh, completely. Yeah, we're more sort of a surreal, absurdist sort of act, I would say. Do you class yourselves as one religion or the other, or one community as the other? Very apolitical. Like, yeah, yeah, apolitical and very atheistic. So I would say I would be. Like I grew up in Ardoin, and they've actually grown Bali song. Um, so you couldn't. So our down is the Catholic neighbourhood. Yes. And yeah. Ballysillen is the Protestant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or yeah. essentially sworn enemies. Yeah. Yeah. That was the general vibe of it. Because my family were actually quite staunchly loyalist, which was weird. <laughs> and, that, and then me, which they're all sort of. Uh, well, hang on, hang important. on. So, so what do you mean staunchly loyalist? So. Uh, I probably shouldn't say this. Well, no, yeah, you should. You yeah, should. Yeah, 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 no, you should. Good. You should say this. So my granddad was an orange man, mm -hmm. and uh, so he'd have been one of the guys marching and. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. But it just never, never appealed. When I was growing up, there was always like a pressure, I like to, you know, uh, subscribe to a certain ideology. Now, without the Good Friday Agreement, we wouldn't have had the opportunity, maybe, to come together. We didn't care anyway. But there was always this like invisible wall that would have maybe stopped us. But whenever I was starting out, the notion that you two guys could have been working together, hanging out together, that really would never have happened. But yeah, I mean, now, now we can actually you know, get an audience to respond to us here. Whereas I think 15 years ago, people would have looked at us like we had two heads. I really do. Yeah. I think we might have got chased. You know what I mean, though? Guys, thanks for chatting to me. Go kill them. I mean, in Belfast, that used to be a different thing, but... <laughs> but, but... Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Shaw and Larry! Before you sit, two steaming turds. <laughs> who through our acting masterclass will be transformed into resplendent swans. Their style of humor is just completely different to the type of stuff that I was doing whenever I started out here. Surreal, abstract, and you know, I love that. They're just two lads from a city telling jokes, and that's brilliant. From my early days at the Empire, I realised there was a huge appetite for political satire. And by 1998, I was gigging in some of the biggest venues in Northern Ireland. Oh, good evening, Belfast! <laughs> Three months after the historic referendum on the peace deal, I played to a packed waterfront hall. And we've got the Good Friday Agreement. Peace at last. Give it a round of applause. What about that, eh? Superb! So, uh, who voted yes for the agreement? <laughs> the only combined audience of continuity IRA and DUP in the whole of Ireland. <laughs> Almost a third of the people in Northern Ireland voted against the Good Friday Agreement. Many simply couldn't accept one of its main provisions. That paramilitaries convicted during the Troubles were to be released as part of the peace deal. 
Today's releases brings the total number of prisoners freed so far under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement to 142. William Bell was freed at the maze, and Delbert Watson and David Curlett were released from McGabbery, the three men convicted of the murder of Dundrum businessman Jack Kilty, the father of comedian Patrick Kilty. In terms of the people that killed my dad getting out, I can only speak for myself. I can't forgive them for what they did. But whether or not these people are in jail, it's not going to bring my dad back. I felt if this is what has to happen to stop this happening to someone else, OK, I'll suck that up. But I knew that was going to be a big sticking point for a lot of people. I want to speak to one of those people. So my next stop is County Fermanagh, which during the Troubles saw hundreds of cross-border attacks by the IRA. I've come to the Protestant church in the village of Akadrumsey to meet a staunch opponent of the Good Friday Agreement. Arlene Foster is the leader of the Democratic Unionists, the largest and most powerful political party in Northern Ireland. He was 34. No, it was just the year after Daddy was shot. As a child, she worshipped here before she and her family were forced out of the area by a growing wave of violence. This is chap here. That was way back at the beginning in 1972. What really strikes me about this graveyard is it's so small. Yeah. And there's so many people mm -hmm. that were killed. It certainly had its fair share of funerals. My father survived, thankfully, for 32 years after he was attacked. Under the leadership of Ian Paisley, the DUP argued against the Good Friday Agreement from the start claiming that it threatened the Union with Britain. This is an evil day that has come to our province. We have enemies without, we have traitors within. Despite 20 years of peace, Arlene and the DUP still don't fully support the agreement, and I want to know why. So Arlene, what was it like growing up so close to the border? Well, it was a very, very tight community here, and I grew up during the whole era of Troubles, and my father was a police officer. What age were you whenever the IRA tried to kill your dad? I was eight, and um, he'd gone out to close in the few cattle that he had in the buyer, and when he was closing the buyer door, they opened up uh, and tried to shoot him, and he crawled into the house on all fours. I remember that very vividly, because blood coming out of his head, and we all lay on the floor for what felt like an eternity before help came. How does that affect your relationships with your neighbours in a tight-knit area like this where there's nationalists and unionists living so close together? Yeah, well, I think that was the most difficult thing for my father to come to terms with because it was very clear that someone locally had set him up, as it were, you know. On top of that, then, you were also involved in another attack whenever you were on a school bus. The, yeah. The, yeah. The, the IRA targeted the, the bus driver as well. Yeah, he was a part-time member of the EDR. They put a bomb under his bus, probably thinking when he started the bus it would go off and there'd be no children in the bus. But the bomb actually went off at the bottom of the town. So it was pretty horrific. Age 17, Arlene was interviewed in the aftermath of the bombing. And there was about two or three seconds silence and um, then everybody started to scream. And, and I got up and said, don't panic, don't panic. And, Everybody get out. Having lived through the attempt on her dad's life and the attack on her school bus, Arlene went on to study at Queen's University in Belfast, alongside a rather dashing young psychology student from Dundrum. You know, you and I have so much in common yeah, in yeah. terms of your father was attacked, my father was killed, mm -hmm. and then we ended up at Queen's at the same time. That's right. I get into comedy. Mm -hmm. You get into politics. Yeah. I would have signed up for the Good Friday Agreement. I thought that was a good idea. Mm -hmm. You weren't so sure on that. No, I wasn't. And it was principally about the release of the prisoners, which to me was just an anathema. You know, how can you allow people who have um, committed some of the most heinous crimes just walk free as if they had done nothing? The men that killed my dad. Yeah were let out as part of that agreement. Yeah. And I felt it had to be done. I find it difficult that if I'm prepared to, to suck that up, mm -hmm. that maybe some other people that haven't gone through what I've gone through find it difficult. That, that's true for you. 
But for others, they want justice. Sadly, there are some people who still want retribution. That's why 20 years later, we're talking about the legacy of the Troubles and we're still struggling as to how to deal with it. For many unionists, one of the sticking points of the agreement was that it allowed for future referendums on the reunification of Ireland. If the majority did want to join the rest of Ireland, how would it feel to be a unionist outside of the UK? First of all, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, I let's think get I, that very let's clear. Get that in. It's a very hypothetical situation to be in, but if it were to happen, I'm not sure that I would be able to continue to live here. I would feel so strongly about it, I would probably have to move. Where would you go? Well, that's the question. <laughs> it's not going to happen, so I don't have to worry about it, I don't think, in uh, any time soon. You know, I like Darlene, and that confused me, because the party and the policies that she has, there's so much of it that I really disagree with. But meeting her here at this church, I can understand how deeply communities like this suffered and how that pain still affects their view of where we're headed. It made me really sad that someone who had to leave her home whenever she was eight years of age feels if a vote went a different way, she would have to leave the country. That makes me really sad because that's not the UK I want to live in. And it's not the Ireland I want to live in. The words of the agreement are clear. Apparently what happens is the prisoners will be released and then you're going, you, yeah, look at that Chucky there going, hey. <laughs> and then the IRA will give back its guns. <laughs> No, they're taking it very seriously. They are, they are, because they've actually appointed, the IRA and Sinn Féin have appointed Martin McGuinness <laughs> to meet with the IRA. <laughs> hey, <laughs> where's he gonna hold that meeting in a phone box? <laughs> More than 500 prisoners were released as a result of the peace deal, and over half were members of the provisional IRA. I've come to the Felons Club in West Belfast to meet one of them. Shana. Told you I could come in the Murlock, uh, Paddy Cute. There you go. Over in a wall. Okay, well let's go. Shana Walsh now works for Koista, an organisation that helps former Republican prisoners. But he used to be an IRA commander in the Mays prison. I want to ask him why he thinks letting out hundreds of paramilitaries was key to the peace process. So, Shina, after all these years, I've made it to the Felons Club. Why have I not been here before? It would have been coming down as sort of a step for you, Paddy, like, let's face it, you know, <laughs> talking to the former IRA prisoner community. Let's talk about why did you join the IRA? What made me actually make the jump into the movement was the behaviour of the British Army. They would raid houses at four o'clock in the morning, seal off whole streets, you know, house to house. If you weren't quick enough to get your door open, you got it smashed in. And if you're any way lippy or whatever, as teenagers tend to be, yeah. they would beat the crap out of you. So whenever you signed up for the IRA, yeah. you would have known that you weren't joining the Boy Scouts. You were joining an organization that was going to kill people. Well, that's, that's what you were trained to do. We were involved in an armed campaign to bring an end to British involvement in Ireland. It also involved a lot of people being killed that weren't involved in anything, a lot of innocent yeah. people. There are a lot of things that happened which don't sit comfortably with the past and the time. Do you mean you regret it? I regret the fact that we were at war. You, you know, regret what you did? I can't say that I regret what I did, Holly, to be honest with you. No, I mean, I, I, I want you to be honest. No, I, I wouldn't be true to myself if I was saying that I regret what, what I was involved in, because I'm actually proud of having been involved in the struggle here. Shana was one of the longest serving of all IRA prisoners. He was first arrested aged 16 in 1973 during an attempted bank robbery to provide funds for the IRA. His final conviction for preparing a mortar attack came in 1988, the year my dad was murdered. Whenever I went into Crumlin Road Jail, the group who were charged with killing your father actually ended up on the same wing. In the same jail as the people that killed my dad? 
Yeah, the same wing. So that you, you guys wouldn't have been segregated? We weren't segregated. You, you would pass them on the London. It was a very tense period in the prison. It culminated um, actually in the death of two loyalists in, in the jail. Wow. So how many years in total did you end up in jail? Uh, I was released in September 1998 as a result of the Good Friday Agreement. Mm. I was 42 years of age at the time and I'd spent 21 of those years in jail. So when the moment arrived that you knew you were out, how did you feel? Well, it was a sense of unbelievable elation, to be honest with you. You use that word elation, really? Oh, absolutely. Mm. Because, you know, I remember it from the other side. I remember knowing that the guys that killed my dad were going to be getting out of jail. And I remember at the time feeling, if this can bring peace, we got to do this. Mm -hmm. And yet, I can see how so many other people wouldn't have felt the way that I felt. No, could, you, could you see at the time? Absolutely, yeah. You know, I still run into people um, today who, if they had their way, they'd put me back in jail tomorrow. But we saw the release of political prisoners as being an intrinsic part of the deal. It gave the nationalist community a real sense that the British are serious about ending the conflict. Once they release the prisoners, you know that the war is over. For you guys in the IRA, was the Good Friday Agreement the end? Absolutely not. So it was a staging post? Absolutely. But it's going to take work to bring about a United Ireland. I think it's great that Shana got out of jail. I think it's great that they all got out of jail because we have to move on. But does Shana have the answer for the future? I don't think he does. You know, Shane is really convinced that there's going to be a United Ireland and that what he believes is going to happen in the future will happen. And the people on the other side, they feel exactly the same way. There's no middle ground. Having spoken to Arlene and to Shana, I'm wondering if instead of really moving on, we haven't just spent the last 20 years papering over the cracks. The Northern Ireland Secretary, Mo Molum, is holding fresh meetings with politicians at Stormont to try to rescue the peace process. As soon as we voted yes to the Good Friday Agreement, arguments between unionists and nationalist politicians threatened one of its main aims, that they should govern Northern Ireland together. Mo Molum, the Northern Ireland Secretary of State, and a driving force behind the agreement, had the unenviable task of keeping the two sides talking. See the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, please welcome Dr. Mo Mole! I interviewed Mo in August 1999 as the peace deal hung in the balance. The audience gave her a cheer, like a rock star for a British Northern Ireland Secretary of State. It was crazy. So it's been a quiet week then. What have you been up to? <laughs> it's been a bad one, I think, I have to say. It's been tough. But I had to come for one reason, and that is for the last 18 months, whenever I've got stuck in the process and I've, I wanted a children's concert or a compare for a show, he'd do it. So I just wanted to come and say thank you. And... Very nice. Then... <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, do you want something else now? Are you going to... <laughs> no, well, I'm, I don't... I'm booked up for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Just looking back on that now makes me realise the impact that she actually had. She told us to our faces what lots of other people said behind her back. Oh, for fuck's sake, can you not just sort it out? Is it as difficult as it looks? Are we ever going to get there? Yes, we are, because people want it. Mm -hmm. And... Yeah. The politicians, the politicians are trying. It's not easy. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be tough. Then it may take a wee while, but we're going to make it. It's almost what we needed. And looking back on it now, it's almost what we need again. Mo was struggling with cancer even then, and she died in 2005. <laughs> For me, her message was simple. Without reconciliation, you can't have real peace. 
But how can those of us who still bear the scars of the conflict ever really be reconciled with the people who harmed us? To find out, I've come to Derry, or Londonderry, depending on which side you come from. This predominantly Catholic, nationalist city lies right on the border. In 1972, British troops shot dead 13 unarmed protesters here. A 14th died later from his injuries. From time to time, firing would break out again and the crowd would scatter. Two months after Bloody Sunday, a Catholic schoolboy from the city's Craigan estate was blinded by a rubber bullet, fired by a British soldier. Richard. Yes, Paddy. How are you doing? Uh, yes, Richard. How are you doing? <laughs> that's, a, that's a classic dairy oh, welcome. Oh, you're right, hey. yeah. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. You're my old school. Very good. Where are we off to so, here? Now we'll walk up along the football pitch of the, where I was shot in 1972. Despite what happened to him, Richard Moore grew up to become a respected peace campaigner. A supporter of the Good Friday Agreement, he knows a thing or two about reconciliation. We're going to just step down here. It's about, yeah, go ahead. about 18 inches of a step right. there. And, the yep. Brand it now. Yeah. I would have been around eight or nine years of age when the, the troubles started. It should have been frightening, but it was actually more exciting, you know, because you would see maybe the men arriving in a, a, a lorry, putting it across the road and then set it on fire. And like, you don't normally see men doing that. I can, I can see how, as a wee boy, that, that could get you going. That's right. You know, like, I can remember the IRA patrolling our streets, like IRA foot patrols. And you would have knew those guys? Well, I wouldn't have knew them, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is 40 years ago, and you're still saying, oh, no, I didn't know them. Are you mad? Well, they used to let you hold the rifles, for example. They held a submachine gun or whatever, and I just held it to give it back to them. Looking at it from where we are today, you know, it is crazy. But then it almost seemed like for fun. You're looking at the backs of the houses there, are you? Yeah, yeah, we are indeed. Uh, well, that's where the army lookout post was positioned. So I was shot at the bottom of that, down there. Like, how clear is all of that? Because it's how many years now? Uh, well, I have to say this is the first time that I've been back at this particular site since I was shot, so... Are you kidding me? Uh, I've never been back here before. I've been up at the school, but never down to the actual site of where I was shot. And the view that I have now, that's the last thing you That's you, the last you saw? thing I saw. Uh, and, you know, what's, what's interesting to me, there's children playing in the background. You can hear them playing. You know, in my mind's eye, I see them. So this, you know, the sounds takes me right back. And that particular day, I got out of school as normal and ran along the bottom of the football pitch. A British soldier fired a rubber bullet. It hit me here in the bridge of the nose. I lost this eye. I was left completely blind in that eye, you know. For my parents, I think it was one of the most awful things that could happen. One day, their 10-year-old son is out playing football, and, and the next day, I can't walk across the living room without having to feel the wall. That just must have been... I, I can't even get my head around it. I brought the rubber bullet with me. I don't know if he... That's the actual... That's the actual one there. It was lying on the ground beside me, and uh, the teacher picked it up. It's not very often, Richard, that I'm actually stuck for something to say, but um, you're back here and you're carrying that bullet Aye. that changed your life. As a result of his experiences during the Troubles, Richard went on to found the international charity Children in the Crossfire. And 13 years ago, he also did something extraordinary. He sought out and befriended the British Army soldier who shot him. Me meeting Charles in no way is trying to say that what you did was all right. What Charles did was wrong that day. But if I keep banging that drum, you blinded me, that's not going to progress anything. You know, I knew that I forgave the soldier. Now hang on a second here. <laughs> we can't just skim over that. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> well, now, you forgave the soldier. Yes. Now, this is for me really the nub of 
the Good Friday Agreement because the very first page of the Good Friday Agreement talks about reconciliation. But for me, these people killed my father. Mm -hmm. Can I forgive them? I don't think I can. I wouldn't dream of saying to you, you should forgive the guys that killed your daddy. I don't think I have any right to do that. And it's totally understandable that you wouldn't. If anybody thinks that because I forgive Charles, it's going to take away all the hurts that were caused to me and my family all those years ago, it's not going to happen. But what forgiveness does is allow you to let go. It's not about the other person, in my view. It's about yourself. Richard's definition of forgiveness clicked in my head because he said forgiveness isn't about the other people. Forgiveness is about you. Forgiveness is about can you move on, live with it, and make peace with yourself? And in a weird way, I was listening to him and I was thinking, shit. Maybe I've, maybe I've forgiven these people, but I know I haven't. You know, I, I'm not going to go and shake the hand of the people that killed my dad. I'm not going to give them a hug and tell them it was OK. But what you do have to do is to move on in your own head, embrace a new society, include everybody in it, and that includes the people that did those things, and try to build a better future. And after nine years of intense political negotiation, by 2007, that future seemed to be within our grasp. Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness, two former enemies, joined each other in government. I affirm the terms of the Pledge of Office as set out schedule. On the 8th of May, to the amazement of the watching world, Ian Paisley of the DUP and Martin McGuinness of Sinn Féin finally formed the power-sharing government envisaged in the Good Friday Agreement. I believe Northern Ireland has come to a time of peace, a time when hate will no longer rule. How good it will be to be part of a wonderful healing in this province. Do you ever think you get to the stage where there'd be bombs in London and we're not planting them? <laughs> Do you ever think you'd get to the day when you'd miss us? <laughs> Remember the good old days? We used to ring you up, have a wee chat. <laughs> Tell you where the bomb was. <laughs> what time it was going off. Oh, yeah. Oh, we were a better class of murdering bastard. We were. It took a while for the Good Friday Agreement to come good, but for a decade, nationalists and unionists governed here together. Then, in January 2017, power sharing collapsed. Martin McGuinness walked out of government amid a row between Sinn Féin and the DUP. And today, there's still no government in Northern Ireland. That's not what I had in mind when I voted for the peace deal. But I want to know what other people think. We're just doing a wee dock on the 20th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. All oh, right, yes. And how I, things I have... remember it well. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't we get our heads out of the past? It seems to be the politicians can't get their heads out of the yeah. past. We want to get on with everyday life. We want the kids and to be educated some, and, and make it a better place. The politicians right. need to get on with it, yeah. No doubt about it. They get finger out and get back to do what they got paid to do. Mm. And start making decisions and stop falling out of our insignificant nonsense. And run it from across the water. <laughs> Is that what you think? Seriously. Direct. They're not doing nothing here. Do it directly from across the water. To bring back direct rule. Yeah. Wow. They're so caught up in the past that they're not living in the present and not giving us a chance to have a future. Yeah. So I've met Tara for the first time today. today yes. <laughs> totally first time through different friends. And we're getting on like a house on fire. I know nothing about her background. I care less about her background. This is kind of how I wanted all of this place to be. 20 years on, I think we need more people like you. I think there's plenty of us out there. I think there are. All right. Thank you. That was brilliant. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it's funny when you ask people here about the Good Friday Agreement. It feels like these people are being failed by the politicians. The politicians should have grasped that fresh start and taken this society somewhere else. And this place is booming and this place is brilliant, but it's in spite of those politicians. This is Stormont home to the Northern Ireland Assembly, where those politicians should be hard at work. When you come up to this magnificent building, 
and it's more impressive than any parliament building that you've ever seen. And yet, listen, there's nothing. This place is empty, it's like the Marie Celeste. I've come here to meet Emma Rogan, a young Sinn Féin assembly member. Hello. Paddy. How are you doing? Welcome to Stormont. It's a lovely place you have here. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So, um... Emma's constituency includes my home village of Dundrum, and I want to get her take on why things aren't working up here. When I go around the country and I'm talking to people, these aren't the most popular people, the politicians. How does it feel to be a young politician in a government that doesn't exist? Well, it could exist if the arrangements that were made 20 years ago in the Good Friday Agreement were implemented. But we need the institutions up and working for every single citizen, regardless of your religion. There was awful things done on both sides, and you and I both know that. But somebody has to lead the government, and somebody has to, has to, to fill these roles. So you're going to be... Like... I'm not a Sinn Féin supporter, and it's easy to be cynical about politicians on both sides. But like many of those I've met, Emma's outlook has been shaped by what happened to her during the conflict. In 1994, Emma's father, Adrian Rogan, was killed in the notorious Lochan Island Massacre. The UVF brought carnage to the Heights Bar in Lochan Island. Within seconds, six men were shot dead. Lochan Island is just 10 minutes' drive from my home in Dundrum. And a recent official report into the killings there suggested that some of those involved may also have been linked to my dad's murder. He was in the pub that night, enjoyed a pint, the football was on. Um, the UVF came into the bar um, and riddled the bar with, with gunfire and six men were, were shot dead, five were injured. Some of the people that, that killed my dad were also implicated in the killing of your dad. You know, we share something in common. Yeah. I look at things that happen in my life, and I'm sure you do the same, and you think, oh, God, my dad would have enjoyed this. Like, the day I got my driving test, and I knew that day he'd be so proud. Mm. The day my brother's children were born, my nieces and nephews, you know, th those are the days that you think, what we missed out on. These other people were allowed to enjoy that. They got their Christmases, and they got their family passing their exams and getting married, and, like, what did they achieve by doing that to us? You know? And sometimes I, I just have to remind myself, and I'm, I'm sure you do too, that I would much rather be Adrian Rogan's daughter than the man that committed this. I, um, I often think about this, and I think that when you know that your dad was an innocent man, my dad was innocent, you know, I think that really helps you get through it. Yeah. Sinn Féin is made up of a lot of former IRA people that actually did some terrible things too. Can you see how difficult it is for the other side to put that behind them and come together? To be perfectly honest with you, I did struggle with it for a while. I did struggle with, um, well, the IRA did to other families what the UVF did to my family. But I don't want what happened to me to happen to anybody else because of their religion. I think we need to move on from that. That was hard. I mean, that was hard for me. You know, to grow up where I grew up and for Loch and Island to happen so close to where I was. You know, I remember seeing Emma as a kid on TV walking behind her dad's coffin. And she said something, and it just got me. And it's about being proud of your dad, being proud of your past, and, and moving on. If we want to move forward as a society, I think you have to hang on to the memories of the people you love and why it hurts that you miss them. But you have to say, how is this going to change? Are we going to be the people to change it? Good evening! <laughs> Woo! And I've come to the realization, I'm happy to announce it here in Belfast, my hometown, that I'm technically now a Protestant. That's, yeah. <laughs> Viewers in England, this might go a little bit wrong. <laughs> 
So here we go with today's geography lesson. And today's subject is borders. We are about to make the arduous border crossing between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, and it's just happened. There you go. We're now in the South. We're in the Republic of Ireland. I feel way more Irish suddenly. <laughs> you can tell it's sunnier and it's, it's much warmer. You can find now that we're so much further south. And then I think we actually cross back again. Yep, there we go. We're now in the north. Um, and it's as easy as that. And there are hundreds of little roads like this just crisscrossing the most porous border in Europe. In the bad old days, 25,000 troops couldn't secure that border. And you begin to see why. For the army, border country is bandit country. It is known that there were two explosions. The soldiers say they were also raked with gunfire from the Republic 200 yards away. During the Troubles, the border between North and South became one of the most dangerous in the world, full of checkpoints, helicopters and booby traps. But since 1998, it's unrecognisable. So this is the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. And since the Good Friday Agreement, the only way you actually know is, is the white line. There's, there's no frontier post. It's just I'm in Northern Ireland. I'm in Southern Ireland. The other brilliant thing about the Good Friday Agreement was you were allowed to choose whatever nationality you wanted to be. You could choose to be Irish in Northern Ireland, or you could choose to be British in Northern Ireland, or like me, you could choose to be both. And when you take all that identity away and you let people choose what they want to be, then there's nothing to fight about. And so we were able to come together, we were able to make peace, we were able to stop fighting, and we were able to sail into the sunset. Or were we? Northern Ireland may have to follow the rules of the EU single market to avoid a hard border with the Irish Republic. The economic and constitutional integrity of the United Kingdom must not be compromised. A UK decision to leave the customs union would make border checks unavoidable. It's about time the government demonstrated a no surrender attitude. Stand up to the man, stand up to the EU, Rubbish. and let's get on with leaving the EU. Rubbish. The increasingly angry debate over what will happen here after Brexit makes me fear for the future of the Good Friday Agreement and the delicate balance it achieved between unionists and nationalists that has delivered 20 years of peace and allowed an entire generation to grow up free from the violence that scarred my youth. A few miles from my home village of Dundrum is Shimna College. It's an integrated school, which means that Catholics and Protestants are educated here together. The Good Friday Agreement promoted schools like this as one of the answers to our divided society. Hello. Hello. How you doing? He's all right? So I've come to ask the students where they think we're headed. Um, <clears throat> OK. So, I mean, you guys are what? 16, 17? 17. 17. So what's it like growing up here without any trouble? My parents have lost friends and family, and although I haven't personally experienced that, those memories and those stories stick with me. Almost everybody even would know someone who's lost someone because of the troubles. I don't think we're too far after it to not know the danger of sectarian feelings. People don't really talk about it, but people still harbour that pain mm -hmm. from so long ago. Do you think there's still tension out there? Definitely. Well, definitely, yeah. 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 I think it won't be for, like, another couple of generations until sort of, you know, we have children and our children have children so we can, like, fully move away from it. Wow, so you, you think it's going to be two generations? People find it very hard to separate the past from their own identities now, that you can't just say you're Northern Irish. It doesn't matter what happened in the past or what's going to happen in the future. It's just where I'm from. Yeah. So do you guys identify yourselves as unionists, nationalists? I see myself as like a unionist, but I don't let unionism define me as a person, and it's not my core central political belief. In terms of the United Ireland question, I'd be pro United Ireland. You see, this is good because there are opposing political opinions, but you guys are hanging out and having to chat about it. That, that to me, is progress. 
Are you guys optimistic for the future? I think the fact that we are all sitting here as a group, and it's obvious that we all have different beliefs and different opinions, but nobody's at each other's throats about it. I think it's better than it was. There's less people you'll meet that have really strong anger about one side or the other. With integrated education, that's definitely going to result in a more positive outcome. The kids at Chimney College really surprised me because there were two guys and they sat there and he said, I'm a nationalist and I'm a unionist. I'd never met a unionist and sat down and chatted to them until really I left school. The idea that two kids who think completely different about the future of this place can go to school, can sit beside each other, be best of friends, have a laugh and disagree. That is why these kids are the future. The fact that this only represents less than 10% of the education here, I mean, come on. If we want to change this place, there has to be more of this. Before I leave Northern Ireland, I've come for a pint in Dundrum with my brothers Cahill and John and a few of our mates. You make it Belfast. It's not this big, scary place people think it is. You'd be worried walking through central London. I've been out with you in a night in Belfast, Cal, and I, I've been well, quite worried. <laughs> that was exactly why I got it. It's been 20 years. Should we just accept the fact that because we're not killing each other, that's good enough? Possibly not, but the way things were, you know, you have to appreciate how far you've come. Relatively, yeah. it's pretty good progress. I think with the whole sorting the border and Brexit, everybody's expecting a political process to roll out, and it'll, there'll be hiccups and there'll be hurdles, but they'll get there. But you'd want to check that, lads, before you put that up. <laughs> when I started all of this, I was frustrated. I wanted the future that I voted for to be here now. But what I've learned is that it doesn't work like that. You know, just because my dad was killed, like thousands of other people here, doesn't mean that I own that agreement any more than anyone else who voted for it. And if those people are scared or hurt or have reasons why they can't move as quickly as I want them to move, that's really valid. And the fact that nobody hopefully will have to go through what me and so many other people had to go through means the Good Friday Agreement has succeeded. We have peace. And where there's peace, there'll always be a wee bit of hope.